became an instant classic when it came out. I don't hear too many singing the song today, but I remember growing up hearing it played in churches. The lyrics go something like this. This is just a rehearsal. When we get to heaven, we're going to really sing. And I remember hearing that song and listening to different choirs sing that song, and it was just beautiful. And as I was preparing this message, our story is simply a rehearsal of the great controversy that will unfold in these last days. There are valuable lessons for us to learn in today's story. And so it would uh, serve us well in preparing us for the impending crisis that is soon to come. And so uh, this morning I'm using the title, Fiery Trials, Fiery Trials. Before I preach this morning, let us pray. Father in heaven, let the words of my mouth, let the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, my rock, and my redeemer. Speak, Lord, for your people are listening. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen and amen. So we're continuing our Daniel series, and now we dovetail into Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. I heard you already got a preview of Daniel chapter 12 last week. And so I'm glad he left something on the bone for chapter 3. So we're going to go into Daniel chapter 3. And I'm going to begin here in verse 1 to set up the context. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible this morning. And it goes like this. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. That's 90 feet. And it's with six cubits, nine feet. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now, as we continue from chapter 2, God gave, God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream. God seeking to answer not only the question that Nebuchadnezzar went to sleep with on his mind that night, but he also gave him a glimpse of his own kingdom that God will establish and that king would last forever. Daniel gave him the interpretation, but no one else could. Daniel spares the lives of all the wise men by not only telling the king his dream, but then telling him what his dream meant. And so we saw the image Daniel told us. It's a head of gold, his arms of silver, waist and thighs of brass, legs of iron, feet part iron, part clay. But then there is a rock that is cut out from a mountain without a man's hand. And it hits the image at the feet, grinds the entire image up into uh, 
chaff like on a summer threshing floor. The wind blows that image and every remnant of it away. And then that stone begins to become bigger and bigger. And it fills the whole earth. And we recognize that stone represents the kingdom of God. Now we dovetail into chapter 3. And it's as if Nebuchadnezzar has backslid. He's gotten this vision interpreted to him by Daniel, but Nebuchadnezzar doesn't seem to like how the story ended. Nebuchadnezzar says, why am I just the head of gold? Why the whole statue of gold? Nebuchadnezzar recognizes he's the greatest monarch on the planet, but he doesn't understand that he, he's the monarch at that time based on God's sovereignty. And so Nebuchadnezzar is not satisfied with just a head being full of gold. He wants an image that is pure gold. And so he commissions an image on the plain of Dura, 90 feet tall, and it is covered in gold. Scholars agree that the image would not have been pure gold, but it would have been made of wood and then covered in gold. It's there on the plain of Dura. And you can just imagine on this plain there in modern day Iraq with the sun glistening on this gold, it could be seen for miles around. He calls for all of his officials to come and they come for the dedication of this image. And he tells them when the music plays and so forth, everyone needs to bow down to this image. This image represents Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And as the music is played, people begin to bow down because they now have to worship under the threat of losing their lives. Put a push pin there. The government, King Nebuchadnezzar, is forcing them to worship this image under the penalty of death if they don't. So the music goes, and when the music plays, everyone is bowing down. And as we remember in Daniel chapter 1, there are other Jews have been, who have been brought into captivity. They were sitting down at the king's table, and we, only, we don't know their names. We only know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel's name because they are the only characters in the story that do not compromise. They're the only characters in the story that stay faithful to the covenant of God. And so while everyone is at the table eating, they say, we can't eat from the king's table. Just give us vegetables and water for 10 days and let's do a comparison. And they do that and they see that, hey, they're handsome, all that, and they don't have acne, they're ripped, and so forth. And I'm trying to you know, encourage somebody here to try some vegetables and water for 10 days. You never know. You might find this is right because you've been fasting for 10 days. And so, so they're looking good skin is clear, you know, look like they pump an iron, and all they're doing is eating vegetables and drinking water for 10 days, and they said, man, we're going to let you stay on your diet because they don't look like you. Well, here now, all of those Jews that are in captivity, when the music plays, they're bowing down, and everything is going fine, but there, and let me tell you, there's always haters amongst them. Always haters, monsters, because not everybody bowed down. Now, where's Daniel? Don't worry, Daniel wouldn't have bowed either, so don't worry. But we know who's there, because it's not important who's not there. It's who's there. And who's there are captives from Israel that are bowing down to this image. But there are three that are standing tall. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So, you know, everybody's supposed to be bowing down, but, but there's some folk bowing down and they're looking around. <laughs> Do you see what I see? They're not bowing. Everybody else bows down? That's just it. Man, we gotta go talk to the king. Because, see, these are the three young men after Daniel was promoted, 
He said, King, you should probably use my boys here too. They, they, they're, they're good, you know. And, and so the king gives them positions of authority in the kingdom. Now the haters are the Babylonians who say, you know, put these Hebrew captives over us. So they can't wait to get to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, just want to make sure we're clear on this. I want to make sure I didn't understand it. You know, I know the language. It's my language. But you said with the music play that we're supposed to bow down to the image that you have erected. This is, by the way, it's a beautiful image, King, full of gold. And, and, and weren't we all supposed to bow down, King? And the king said, yes. And, and did you say that if we don't bow down, that you were going to throw these folks in a, in a furnace? Yeah, that, that's what I said. Well, King, guess what? And you can hear the disdain in their voices when you read chapter 3. You know those three Hebrew boys, Shadrach. They probably wanted to curse when they said the name. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those three guys, King, they put you on front street. They didn't even bow down. They didn't even look like they were bowing down. They were standing tall and erect. Now, the Bible tells us in the story, when the king heard this, he's upset. Because that would be a sign or a show of disrespect to the king and his authority. The whole purpose of putting up the golden image is to let everybody know that he was the man. And by not bowing, you're saying he's not the man. But the king also recognizes that there's something different, something special about these three guys. So after they have been outed by the haters, they are brought, the, Nebuchadnezzar said, bring, bring them to me. And, and so now they come before Nebuchadnezzar. Now Nebuchadnezzar says, now, you guys probably didn't understand it. I, I may have spoken an accent. And so you might not have been able to interpret it fully. But I say it when you hear the music. Um, and it's in symphony. You need to bow down. You need to bow, like everybody else, bow down. You need to bow down. And so probably you didn't understand. So we're going to give you a second chance. So get the music ready. Get ready to strike it up, band. And all you need to do when the music plays, you just go ahead and bow down and this issue is done. I know it's probably a misunderstanding. Uh, you, you got mistranslated. But yeah, you need to bow down like everybody else. Notice their response. Their response is clear. Bible records in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Mm -hmm. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, yes. is able. Yes. Our God is able. Yes. He is able, O oh King, yes. to deliver us from the burning fire of the furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand. Okay, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Now, folks, I mean, you can imagine the king is hot now. They say this to his face with all the officials around. They can take him into a, a private room. They say this out in public. King, our God is able to deliver us. Don't get it twisted. Just because we're in captivity doesn't mean your God is stronger than our God. We're here because we were acting up. But understand, our God who allowed us into captivity.
baptism. Yes. Who allowed us to be trained in the Chaldean language and the Chaldean history and the Chaldean theology. That God that allowed us here, he is able to save us. Yes. He will deliver us from you, King. He could. The question is, if he would. They don't know that answer. They know he could, but they don't know if he would. And so, King, understand, we will not bow down. And our God is able to deliver us. But, King, even if he doesn't, we are not going to serve your gods. And we will not bow down to that statue. Because we know the Bible says, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Amen. Thou shalt not make any graven images. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God, a jealous God. So we're not going to do that, King. Yes. We're not going to do that. So our God, he can deliver us from you. And even if he decides not to. See, everybody wants to be delivered. And if we're not delivered, we have an attitude with God. Amen. These young men are clear. God could deliver them. But even if he doesn't, yes. we're not bowing down. And we're not going to bow down to this image. Amen. So obviously, Nebuchadnezzar is hot. He's hot at this particular time. And he's angry. So now that they have you know, disrespected him openly, Nebuchadnezzar says, turn this thing up seven times. And I'm saying to myself, the last time I checked, fire was hot. <laughs> what difference does it make? If you turn it up seven times. The fire is fire. But he's mad now. Turn it up. I want it seven times higher. And so he turns the fire up and he gets the strongest guards, bind them up, bind them up, and throw them into this furnace. We'll, we'll see about this. And so the strong men in Babylon, they bind them up and they toss them into the furnace. The furnace coat is so hot, it kills the soldiers. That's how hot it is. We believe it's a kiln that has an opening that you can see into because they are watching as these men are being thrown. And every time one is being thrown, the one throwing them is dropping down from the heat. Thanks, thanks. And as they go into the fire, Nebuchadnezzar is sitting and watching this. I don't know if he was wearing glasses or not. <laughs> Do you see what I see? Didn't we throw three in there? Yeah, King, and the three that threw them in there, they're dead. Yeah, but I'm counting four in the fire. And one looks like the Son of God in the fire. Now, folks, you missed your shout on that alone. Because they go into fire, but they're not consumed in the fire. The men who threw them in the fire have dropped dead. He sees three, and now he sees four in the fire. So let, let me help you here. Let me help you so somebody can celebrate today. Let me help you here. One, we have to understand this. That the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that there is no temptation that happens except that which is common unto man. Right. And the Bible says, and God is faithful. Yes. That with every temptation, he will provide a way of escape. Right. But here's the question. Where is there out? Where is there escape? Because they only can do one of two things. They can say, well, man, the music started playing and my shoes are untied. I need to tie my shoes up while the music is playing. 
And as soon as the music stops, you could have gotten up. You didn't worship the image. You didn't worship their God. But the very fact that you were on your knees would lead you to have will lead you to have been compromised. So they don't want to bend down. But now by standing up, they go into the fire. So where in the world, if God is faithful that with every temptation, he will provide a way of escape so that they can bear it, where in the world is their exit? Where is their plan of escape? Where is that place that God will open up that they can go through so that the burden is not greater than they can handle? Folks, here's the lesson. Sometimes you got to go through in order to come out. There was no other exit that they could take and be faithful to God and not compromise. They had to go in the fire to go through the fire. But in the fire is the only place that they can be faithful to God and not compromise. It was the place that God had already ordained because when they got in the fire, Jesus was already there in the place, turning up the air conditioning on the pool 72 on a seven times heated furnace so that when they got in there, they're like, man, it feels good out here. But down in this furnace, man, it's, it's cooler here than out on the desert in Dora. Because God had already prepared for them to go into the fire and he had already made provisions. Many of us don't want to go in the fire. Yes. And because we don't want to go in the fire, we end up compromising our witness. Yes. You've got to go through before you can come out. Yes. We have to go through some things, folks. We have to go into the midst of a fiery furnace for God to do his greatest deliverance. If they don't stand up, we don't have this story. It's because they stood up and because they refused to compromise their witness because they said God can deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we are going to remain faithful to God. We're going to remain faithful to the covenant and we will not bow down. And so they have to go into the flames. Now, folks, I don't know if they, their face got hot. I don't know. But what I do know is that while they were down in the fire, the ropes that bound them, stay with me, were burned off. Yes. They were free to walk around in the fire. They were not bound in the fire. They were free. The fire, all it did was burn those things that bind them. They were set free when they went in to the fire. They were bound before they got into the furnace, but they were free when they were in the furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar looked and said, hey, Sarah and Meshach, y'all, y'all, come on out here. Come on out here. And the Bible tells us when they come walking from the furnace, folk, they don't even smell like fire. But Isaiah said, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. They don't even smell like smoke. They, they smell like Chanel for men uh, when they come out. They, they smell like good. They don't smell like fire. There's no smoke. But that which bound them had been burned up and consumed. Nebuchadnezzar's looking at them. He says to himself, Lord have mercy. I've never seen anything like this. The Bible says... In Daniel chapter 3, and the satraps, verse 27, administrators, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair on their head was not singed, nor their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Amen. who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. Amen. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not 
serve nor worship any God except their own God. Amen. Therefore, he says, I make a decree. And you know, never can that goes from one extreme to the other. I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Their houses shall be made of ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Amen. This is a pagan clean king making this declaration about the true and living God. And that's because God will never be without a witness. Never will he be about a witness. Be without a witness. And then it says, then the king promoted Shepherd, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So even the haters now have allowed them to get another promotion. Amen. <laughs> They've been promoted even higher. <laughs> Folks, this is just a rehearsal. Yes. It's just a rehearsal. The same principles and concepts at play here on the plain of Dura is right ahead. Yes. When the government seeks to dictate to us how and what and when to worship. Mm -hmm. Now you may not see it now. Mm -hmm. You may not see it now, but if you look at today's news through the lenses of scripture, mm -hmm. you have to look through the lenses of scripture. The lenses determine your perception. You know, there's a story of uh, 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 a man and his wife, and they have some new neighbors that are across the street. And so the lady, she's washing her clothes, and she's putting her clothes on uh, the, the clothesline. And while she's putting her clothes on the clothesline, the man's wife is looking over at the neighbor and saying, what is wrong with her? Why is she putting those clothes out there to dry? And those clothes are still dirty. And the... The husband said, well, she, she's washing her clothes. Yeah, what, what kind of sense does that make? And so each and every day while the lady is going out there putting her clothes after she washes them on the clothesline, uh, she's looking out the window and saying, what is wrong with her? Those clothes are not clean. Anybody can see that those clothes are not clean. So this goes by for about a week. And finally, the husband, he says, I need to do something about it. So, so the next day, she gets up. And she sees the neighbor, and she looks, and she says, honey, come here, honey, come here. And he says, yes, dear. She says, she finally cleaned her clothes. They're clean, look, they're totally clean. I wonder what she did. He says, she didn't do anything, sweetheart. He said, what do you mean? He says, I just went and washed your windows. <laughs> her windows were dirty. And that's why the clothes look dirty. So he just washed her windows to show her the clothes were clean the whole time. Right. Folks, it's the lenses we have to look at the news. Right. Right. This Supreme Court battle is not about Democrats and Republicans. It's about an institution that is going to be affected for our time. For our time. For the next 20 or 30 years, the Supreme Court is being affected by this appointment. And we have to understand, based on scripture, it's going to have to require the laws of our land to be changed in order to bring about Revelation chapter 13 and 14. So we have to look past uh, partisan politics and look at everything that's happening in light of scripture. And from those lenses, we can see, oh, the setup is already in work. I anticipate uh, Brett Kavanaugh being appointed to the Supreme Court. I already know that's going to happen. Now, it doesn't make sense. But it is going to happen. And that's going to affect the Supreme Court and their judgments. People have already said for 20, 30 years. So it will be for the rest of my lifetime if the Lord allows me to live longer. And those changes will begin to set in motion a chain of events. We've got to know where we are in the prophetic stream of time because that tells us what we've read in Daniel chapter 3. This is just a rehearsal. Yes. The time is coming where each
each and every one of us, we are going to have to stand for God even when no one else will. And there will be no way of escape for us other than being faithful to God. God is faithful that with every temptation, he'll provide a way of escape. And let me tell you, your way of escape is just being faithful. Amen. It is being faithful. Amen. Time is coming when that debit card won't work. Amen. It won't work. If it works, we know who you really are. Amen. We'll know who you are. See, see, let me tell you, folks. We didn't tear as they grow together. We the tares, that's what Jesus says. The wheat and the tares, they grow together until the harvest, and then the angels separate. When that time comes, there will be a separation, and we will actually see who's who. People who we thought were with us, they'll be getting groceries while we're hungry. Mm -hmm. Their card will work, ours will be blocked. Mm -hmm. And we'll see who really is. See, right now, as we the tares grow together, there will be a separation. And that's when we'll find out who's on the Lord's side and who's not. We have to prepare each and every day to take our stand for the Lord. Amen. Don't deceive yourself in thinking, I'll get myself together when that time comes. If you're not together when that time comes, you're lost. You will be lost. There will be no epiphany and then you're going to stand for God. What you are now is what you're becoming. If you're compromised now, you'll continue to be compromised. Unless you make a deciding appeal for the Lord Jesus Christ to change you and to baptize you anew, whatever your character is right now, that's the way it will be unless God intervenes. Because that's the only thing we're taking with yes. us to glory. Amen. These bodies, we're not taking this. The Bible says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the dead of Christ shall rise, and we who are alive, and we're going to be caught up. First Corinthians says this mortal must put on immortality, and this corruptible must put on incorruption. So God has a new body prepared for us, but the same old you feels it. And if your character is not that which will meet the examining eyes of Jesus. You won't be there. You won't be there. So folks, this is just a rehearsal. We are all going to experience fire and trials. It's common. It's for all of us. But understand, in the fire is Jesus. Jesus is in the fire. That's why we ought not avoid the fire. We got to go in the fire. Jesus is in the fire. That's our way of escape. If God didn't deliver Jesus, don't expect him to deliver us through every fire we try. He will allow us to experience it. Our deliverance is assured, but it doesn't mean you won't experience persecution. It doesn't mean that you won't experience hardship. It doesn't mean that Jesus experienced hardship. Jesus experienced persecution. But Jesus came out on the other side of the tomb. Amen? Amen. We just have to make our calling and our election sure. Daniel 3 is just a rehearsal. And we'll see that played out when we get to our study of Revelation. We'll see it play out again. But see, this was on a local scale. Revelation talks about a universal scale. A worldwide skill where people are called to make a decision for God. We have to make a decision each and every day that we are going to serve Jesus. Little compromises lead to bigger compromises. Being faithful today prepares you to be faithful tomorrow. And then faithful the next day. And faithful the next day. God is right now looking at our characters. It's what's on the inside. Not the stuff on the outside. What's on the inside? What does God see when he looks into the crevices of your heart? The place that no one else has access to but God. What does he see? Is it a reflection of himself? Or is it sin? Secret sin. Hidden from every human eye. But not hidden from God. That's the question. My appeal this morning is that everyone within the sound of my voice will declare before heaven and earth 
I'm making my calling and I'm making my election sure today. I'm not waiting for tomorrow. I'm not waiting for next week. I'm not waiting for prayer meeting. I'm making the decision today. I will be one that will stand for God. Though the heavens fall, though everybody around me bow down, I am going to stand for God. I'm going to stand for God. But in order to be able to stand for God, you have to have God's character recreated in you. It's only by beholding we become changed. And we have to spend time with Jesus. We have to read the word of God. We have to spend time in prayer. And by beholding Jesus in personal devotion, we become changed. You don't change yourself. You're changed in the presence of God. That's why it's so important for us to come into the house of the Lord every time the doors are open so we can enter into that presence. And that's where God bestows those blessings. Oh, yes, he can do it in the quietness of your home. Yes, he can do it in your prayer closet. But we need to come together as well. Because there's things that God does for us corporately. He doesn't do individually. But we've got to spend time with God. We need to esteem the word of God more necessary than our food. And then we have to ask God to search us out. Search our hearts. And God, if there's anything that is unlike you, we have to give him permission to perform surgery. And just as Sister Tammy had open heart surgery, God is not trying to fix your heart. He's trying to give you a heart transplant. He wants to give you a heart of flesh. He wants to give you a new heart. The heart that you have is insufficient. You need a new heart and you need a new spirit. God will do that if you grant God the permission. You have to give him the permission. So this morning, if that is your desire, if that is your desire to stand for Jesus, Jesus though the heavens fall, I invite you to please stand at this time. This is my first appeal. First to feel, you're making your call and your election sure today. Standing before heaven and earth, declaring, I want to be ready when Jesus comes. I'm standing right now, God, declaring that I want to be ready, that when the whole world bows down, I won't. I will stand for you. I will stand for your kingdom. Stand for your character and for your righteousness. That's my first appeal. Here's my second appeal. God is speaking to somebody here today. I don't know who it is. But God is speaking to you because you have a desire to stand for God. But you are bound by a secret sin. You are bound by a character defect. You're bound by some hereditary tendency that you inherited from your family. You're bound by some cultivated tendency, some sin that you engaged in. And you want to be delivered from that because that bondage keeps you from experiencing the freedom that God offers for us in the flames. They went in bound, but they came out loose. I don't need to know what your issue is. We all got issues. I don't need to know what your issues are. I can't fix your issues anyway. Amen. But God can. Amen. But folks, let me tell you something. Things hidden in darkness will come to light. The issue is, will you bring it to the light? Or will God bring it to the light? And so, my appeal to somebody here today Within the sound of my voice, you know you need deliverance from whatever it is. This appeal is for you. That going into fire means that you have to allow these chains to be broken. And if there's somebody here that needs freedom in Jesus, they need these chains broken. In this moment, I want you to move and come down and I'm going to ask for God to anoint you with his spirit, not only to break the chains, but to keep you free.
in Jesus. Is there anyone bold enough to ask for your chains to be broken this morning? Anyone? Then the sound of my voice, you just declare it. God, I need the chains that are in my life to be broken. And only you can break those chains. So here I am, Lord. Here I am. Is there anyone here? Anyone here? Amen. Amen. Anyone else? You're at declaring, God, I want my chains broken. Only God can do it. But God's Spirit can break chains that have kept you in bondage for decades. God can deliver you. Amen. Amen. Come on down. Come on down. God can deliver you. You can get your deliverance today. God can change attitudes. God can change habits. God can change tendencies. He can do all of that. God can change your very DNA. God can change you. You may have cancer in your family, and God can change your DNA today. You may be in bondage to fear. God can deliver you from that today. Anyone who wants to be free today, you want to have these chains broken in the name of Jesus. We invite you to come on down. Jesus is present. Jesus is here. And Jesus is the one that's going to set us free today. Anyone else here? I'm not going to prolong this much longer. I'm not going to prolong this. Do you want your chains to be broken? Is there anyone else with the sound of my voice? Anyone else? Father, we forever thankful for 
the things that we do have done I and the things that you're going to do. Now everybody at the sound of my voice agrees that the secret sins that we've been hiding, that there are cleansed right now by the blood of the Lamb. Now shoot!